25. 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin, you are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin. Neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like straying sheep, strayed like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. May God add his blessing to his Thank you. Well, just a few announcements before we begin the message this morning. Bob Holdell is back there by the front door. He has your contribution statements. If you need those for tax purposes, uh, you can pick those up from Bob today. Also, uh, tonight is our annual meeting at 5 o'clock. Uh, we'll be uh, beginning with um, establishing our covenant membership. If you have not uh, had the opportunity yet to talk with the elders or share your testimony and just have that interview, don't worry about that. Um, if you'd like to do that today, they'll be available after the service and before the meeting. Um, if you've yet to, uh, if you're concerned about believers' baptism by immersion, um, we have an opportunity coming. Uh, it can be as early as this coming Saturday uh, to uh, involve yourself or be willing to do that. And so I'd like you to talk to me if that's something you'd like to do. Um, Tonight isn't the, the only time you can become a member of a covenant member of Discovery Church. So um, this is a process, and we'll be receiving members throughout the year uh, whenever you're ready. So uh, we encourage you that everyone can come to the meeting tonight. Um, really, it's going to be a celebration of God's work in the life of this church in, in 11 months. And it's a great celebration. So uh, the meeting, uh, the agendas are here uh, and at the door, if you want to look at it, it's not a real long agenda. And so um, I don't think it's going to take a real uh, lengthy period of time. And then following that, our youth uh, ministry will, will meet here for a time uh, together. So uh, we encourage our students, 7th grade to 12th, to come, come back tonight uh, for that very special time. So uh, I think hopefully that's all the announcements. Um, there's probably a few more. I want to thank Aaron for sharing last week um, from his heart. I hear he did an awesome job. And it's always great when you go away and know that God's people are going to be taken care of. And um, there's, there's great worship and great preaching of the Word. So, um, I golfed six times um, when I was in North Carolina. The weather was so wonderful. And I did have the opportunity to go to the cradle of golf, which is called Pinehurst, North Carolina. And they had the U.S. Open there. And it was kind of fun just to walk around the clubhouse and see some of the things there. My journey with, with golfing started when I was 16 years old. It kind of started very interesting. My neighbor uh, that lived in Kitty Corner across the street from me in California, her husband had died. She was going through the stuff in her garage and noticed there was a set of, a starter set of Wilson golf clubs sitting in the garage that she came over and offered to me. In that little starter set was seven clubs, four irons, two woods that were actually wood, 
and a little blade putter with a, with a leather grip on it, and a little plaid bag with a strap on it. And I proudly carried those clubs for a long time because I couldn't afford anything better than that. But as uh, since my introduction to the game of golf over 40 years ago, um, with this very small set of clubs, golf clubs have experienced a market transformation. They've gone through a revolutionary process of refinement from the first day that I started. The hard to hit very solid blade irons have, were refined to put a cavity in the back of them so that they offer you more forgiveness in accuracy and as a pastor I love forgiveness, right? And so when you can swing a golf club and you get forgiveness, that's good things because I sin often and miss the mark with my clubs, right? And uh, I noticed that uh, all these refinements made these clubs easier to hit. And then there, the woods clubs started as wood, and then they were steel. And now they're, they're this, this really thin, trampoline face titanium that your ball just sort of rockets off. Well, it sometimes does when you, when you swing right. And uh, they've all been refined quite a bit in the last 40 years. Club shafts have been refined. The grips have been refined from leather grips to now, to now uh, these rubberized, sticky grips. And then certainly uh, we don't have wood shafts, we have metal shafts and, 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 and aluminum type shafts, very light and graphite shafts. And then the balls have more dimples and less dimples and higher compression and lower compression. They're always messing with things to refine it because the goal is they want to give you equipment that will make you want to perform better, right? They want your game to be improved. They even have a, a, a classification of game improvement irons, right? They're going to make your game better because the whole goal in, in the advertisement and uh, those who are building and refining these clubs is they want to make the game more enjoyable for you, to shoot lower scores and to be confident. Now, refinement is something we are very used to. The fact that I carry, you know, this little phone. You remember what cell phones were when they first, they were these bags that people used to carry around on their shoulders, right? These are the big massive things you had to put an antenna on the roof of your car so the thing would work, right? It is amazing how much refinement, how, how much effort has gone into making these little puppies, you know, just rule your life, right? And, and own your time. Uh, I kind of say that, you know, I don't know how to say that, but anyway. <laughs> so refinement is something we're accustomed. Think of the, the, the automobiles out there over the years, how they've been refined. And now you, you need a master's degree and, a, and, a, and a, something to, to run some of these cars with, you know, I had to call my daughter you know, from North Carolina, because I couldn't figure out how to get the gas tank thing open, right? <laughs> I, I rented this Toyota Sienna event, and most of them, you know, the gas lid is right there, you know, on the floor. And I'm looking around, and I'm getting ready to pump gas, and I'm almost out of gas. And I'm going, where in the world is the lever to unlatch this thing? So my daughter has a Toyota Sienna event, so I call her, and thank goodness she answered the call. It's the Toyota dad is right down in front of you. There are two levers, one that does the hood and the other does the gap. Oh, great. Wonderful refinements, right? <laughs> Just, they, they mess with you sometimes. So, so refinements are, we're, we're used to things changing for the, for, the, for the betterment of things, to improve the performance of things, right? And I have to say, refinement in golf clubs might increase the distance and accuracy, but you know, sadly, they don't impact a bad golf swing, right? The refinements don't help that. You need to go to your instructor. But one of the things that we learn, after embracing by faith Jesus Christ, and the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, we see that God is interested in doing some refinement work God isn't just happy for us to stay the way we are. God wants to do some, some refinement work. He wants to shape our character. 
He wants to refine our thoughts, our ambitions. He wants to refine our passions, our words, and our deeds. God wants to assist us in ways to improve our performance in holiness, to improve our performance in godliness, to improve our performance in righteousness, doing the right thing. God's committed to that work. And we find several passages of Scripture that remind us of God's desire to continue His work in our life beyond the salvation of our souls to refining us in our lives. One of them is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Be on the screen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what he is or she is a new creation. Right? The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now you're going, what is the new? The new that comes is God's committed desire and work to refine us. Right? God wants to enhance our ability to live our lives in a way that will honor and bring glory to His name. Now we also learn in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. These are some of my dad's most favorite verses of scripture. I can remember uh, one uh, time in my life when the whole church was asked to remem uh, memorize Romans 8, 28 through 39. Great passages, great theology, great truth, great promises. But in verse 29, we see the overall end product of God's refining work in our lives is stated. Here is what God's objective is for us. In bringing us to faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, and God's continuing work beyond that. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image or likeness of his son. You see that? What is God seeking to do in our lives? God's plan is to make us like Jesus. God's ultimate plan, God's ultimate sovereign overarching work in my life through all my experiences, through all the tests, through all the experiences that I have to go through in life, good, bad, and everything in between, is to make me like Jesus. God's work in salvation and in sanctification is refining His children to bear the image and likeness of Jesus Christ as they progress through their life. Now there's some other familiar verses that confirm God's commitment, God's desire on His part to refine us, to make us stronger, to make us more defined as Christians and followers of Jesus, to me it's more defined as sons and daughters of God, which we are, right? One of those is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I am sure of this, being confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. What is the good work that the Apostle Paul is talking about? It is the work of God that He's seeking to complete us in is the work of being conformed to the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what this says is spiritual refinement, that process, is a long-term process that God engages in in our life. We come to faith God is engaged in this process and it continues throughout our life until we are united with Jesus in His presence. Where we will ultimately be like Him and share the glory of His presence here. Ephesians chapter 2.10 is another verse. For we are His workmanship. And notice I put, for we are His workmanship. You can put workmanship if you look at that in the Greek language, it means we are his work of art. A work in process. A work of art in process. Right? We are God's work in process created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in. So there's clear evidence. Everywhere in, 
that as we look in Scripture, that God has a desire. God has a plan and purpose for us. He wants to shape, refine, tenderize, conform, and transform our lives. The great challenge then is, are we cooperating with God's plan? When God wants to achieve His purpose in my life, do I receive that very well? And sometimes the real challenge is, can I really sense that God is seeking to do that? Because when I know that this is God's agenda, God's purpose, God's plan for me, then life takes on a whole different perspective for me. Then the things that happen in my life are just not accidental. They're just not happenstance. They're not just things that are coincidental. All things are happening around me in my life. God is using them to shape certain parts of my life that need to be refined for His glory to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a much needed perspective for all of us. Because we have a variety of experiences in life that are very easy for us to think there's no purpose in them. There's a lot of times in life we can easily say when something comes on, why am I going through this? Why is this happening now? And without that perspective, wait a second, for those he foreknew, then he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. How is the Lord Jesus Christ seeking to do that through this experience? And I believe that Christians are somewhat aware of God's agenda to refine us, right? We know that. We're, we know that we're a work in process, and we, uh, we know that uh, God is seeking to help us and define us and shape us so that we can live in a manner worthy of Christ. He's working to help bring out and reflect the life of Jesus Christ living in us. So we're aware of this agenda. That God wants to change us and reform us. And you know, at times we're okay with a good number of the ways that God is committed to changing us and accomplishing that purpose. I mean, we're okay with the, the, the refinement that produces love in our life. Uh, we're okay with patience, you know, learning honesty and virtue and kindness and we're okay with God smoothing some of the rough edges off of our life, off of our character, off of our disposition. We can okay with that. We're okay with God seeking to refine some of the bad habits out of us. And we're even okay with, to some degree, God's efforts to refine our faith through the challenges that we are given to walk by faith. To put our complete trust in Him. We all know growth in these areas will make us better people. And we can be receptive to that at times in life. We know that God's refining work in our life is going to make us better at relationships. And so we can be receptive to that kind of refinement that's going to make me better in relationships. Because we know how important it is to have good relationships. So refinement in these areas are acceptable to us. And we can really embrace any effort that God would take to refine our lives to be more loving, to be more considerate, to be more wise, to be more reliable, to be more faithful, to be more true. Yeah, God, I'm okay with that. I need that. I can benefit from those things being shaped into my life through the experiences that you bring to me. But I have found there is an area of spiritual refinement 
that is necessary for our spiritual development in being conformed to the image of Christ, that's a little bit more difficult to embrace. A little bit harder to accept. A little bit more challenging to just go with. In fact, this avenue of refinement can be met with strong opposition, strong resistance. And when it is, we fail to experience the very important refinement God sees is necessary to be like His Son. So you're going... What area of refinement can be met with strong opposition by, by me? What kind of spiritual development do we tend to resist or fight against with great fervor at times in our lives? Well, this is the spiritual refinement. The refinement of our spiritual life that comes through suffering. This is the refinement of our spiritual life that comes through relational rejection. This is the refinement of our spiritual character and life that comes when we're on the receiving end of unjust treatment by others. It's the refinement that God brings to our life in pain. You know, in our culture, we've been led to believe that comfort and convenience and ease are really the most important virtues of all. We've lived in a culture and society that's been very blessed materially, and we don't always lack in those kinds of things, and had great advancements in medical work and all these kinds of things. So it's, so it's easy to be accustomed to a life that's enjoyable, pain-free, kind of set up the way that we want it, the way that we like it, the way that works best for us. And when we get accustomed to a, a very comfortable and perhaps spoiled life, it can be difficult when that call comes, when that experience comes to suffer, to experience hardship, to go through people who will potentially reject us in life, and even those experiences where we don't get justice, where we find out how unfair life really is. Because we're used to comfort and ease, we aren't so willing to embrace suffering. We want to run from it. We want to resist it. We want to fight against the painful experiences of life. We want to even go to great extents sometimes to protect our, our lives, protect ourselves from these things happening. How do we do that? We run away from people. We keep people at an arm's length. That's the easiest way to protect yourself from, from this kind of suffering in life. Just kind of keep people at a distance. Don't really engage with them and we'll be fine. And we can easily fail to factor in that we live in a world of sin. Because we live in a world of sin, we can easily subject our lives to some very unpleasant experiences. We realize, this, we, we, we fail to realize that our times are changing. Man's obsession with love of self creates more situations, more opportunities, more probabilities for us that we will have to endure suffering and difficulty in life. There's going to be more rejection. There's going to be more injustice.
And so we can work to avoid the painful experiences of life. And we can even put up a very intensive fight against these things when they come, rather than embracing them. Rather than welcoming them. Rather than looking to God for His purpose in and through them. That God wants to fulfill. To refine us. To be like the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of these trying situations. We can fret. We can stew. And we can waste a lot of energy. Attempting to make sense of things. That will never make sense. Injustice never makes sense. Rejection never makes sense. If you try to put your arms or you, you can't. It's hard. And we fight against them rather than driving our lives deeper into the arms of our Savior for encouragement, for strength, for humility, for endurance, and for persevering long-suffering. Because you know, when we suffer, when we suffer injustice, when we suffer rejection, some things happen to us in life if we go with it, if we embrace it, if we welcome it. When we welcome it into our lives, we gain a greater sense of the grace of God for us in Jesus Christ. We, we gain a, a greater sense of the agony and the difficulty that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered on our behalf to give us salvation. And when we suffer the pain of rejection and the pain uh, and agony of injustice and the, the sufferings of life, it makes us a lot more sensitive in our own lives that we would never ever want to put somebody through what we are experiencing. We don't want to pay back people the suffering that we're experiencing. It makes us a lot more sensitive, a lot more loving potentially if we go with it and learn from our Savior Who entrusted himself to the Father, to the one who is faithful, to the one who is just, to the one who will right everything, to the one who will ultimately bring all things to their end. You know, I have found, and I have seen, in my own life, that I could be quite selfish and proud, thinking I deserve better, while failing to see I cannot become better without this. I'm going to say that again. I have found I could be quite selfish and proud, thinking I deserve better from people, from things in life, while Failing to realize, I cannot become better without this. I don't want to admit that suffering rejection and experiencing injustice can have a profound and positive shaping influence on my life. In becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ, if I respond to this well, I don't want to admit that. Going through these difficult experiences will help me to better understand when others around me are facing these things. And when this kind of refinement comes knocking at my door, I can put up a strong defense against it. I can focus a lot of attention and energy on those I deem are responsible for it. 
I can want to give them a piece of my mind. To convince them of their injustice, their arrogance, their heartlessness, their lack of mercy. And I can rally people to support me, who will defend me, who will agree with me, and who will join my crusade against those I believe are responsible for inflicting this sorrow and rejection into my life, rather than yielding myself to the one who lived his life as a man of sorrows and appointed with grief. A man of many sorrows and appointed You know, I can, I can even get angry with God and say, wait a second, God, how can this be? How can you allow for this to go on? This is so much against what your word teaches, what it said. How come? How can you allow for this while well, failing to really see? I was appointed for this. This is necessary for me to become like Jesus. Seeing suffering in this life puts a whole new perspective on this for us. The perspective we might need. I cannot be conformed to the image of the Son unless I share in the sufferings of the Son. And the more we long to be like the Son, the more likely the more suffering will be a part of our journey in one form or another. It's kind of interesting it wasn't by accident that this morning I asked Doug for us to sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Because you know, for many years I could just sing that song. It's kind of an upbeat song with a little lilt to it. Blessed be your name, right? Get into it. But if you look at the words, were you singing, Blessed be your name, on the road marked to suffering, though there's pain in the offering? Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the, the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, Blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and you take away. But my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. And it's not by accident we sang oceans that I'll rise above the tide. I'll rise above the adversity. I'll rise because my eyes are fixed on Jesus, my Savior, who suffered so much greater than I will ever suffer. So that I could have life. So that I could have eternity with Him. So we can sing these words. And in the middle of times like these, maybe not be, fine, be found blessing the name of the Lord. Rather complaining to the Lord. Folks, I, I, I need this kind of spiritual refinement as much as I don't like it. I'm not saying you have to like pain. I'm not saying you have to like rejection. And I'm not saying you have to like injustice. But if we can see its value, God's purpose in it, to shape us like the sun, we're more likely to receive it rather than resist it.
to welcome it and look to God and yield to Him for His strength and help to see us through it. To hold us in the middle. So I need this kind of spiritual refinement without going through it. I cannot fully identify with my Savior. I will never deepen my understanding of, of my need for Him without <coughs> fellowshipping with Him in His sufferings. You know, I always read that in, in, in Philippians chapter 3. Paul said that he wanted to, to experience the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. As he wrote it from prison, he was experiencing the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. And I know that I studied that passage, I preached on that passage, and said, yeah, the fellowship of his sufferings, saying, yeah, I hope I don't have to experience that. But I can't be like him unless I experience that. And I look at Jesus' writings in the Gospels, and I see that Jesus didn't paint a rosy, unrealistic picture of the journey of a disciple or follower of Him. He gave quite a realistic picture of the life of discipleship, of following Jesus. I want to say and tell you with great confidence, it is a great journey. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it's a great journey. And it ends in a great place. Called heaven. Right? But part of the journey. Will include some difficult times. To remind us. Number one. We need Jesus. We need him more today. Than we needed him yesterday. We need His grace and we need the gospel today and Christ's unconditional acceptance and love for us today that we needed yesterday. It's so easy. Well, I got this Christianity thing figured out. I accepted Jesus. You know, it's. Wait a second. What's this suffering stuff? What's this pain? What's this rejection? What, what, what is this injustice? Yeah, that's, that's part of the road. It's the bumpy part. But Jesus Christ and His Word are the shock absorbers. That provide the leveling and the support and the comfort and the help and the perspective and and. And everything that we need to understand why we are experiencing these things. We need these experiences in life to remind us, number one, we need Jesus. And we didn't sing this song by accident either this morning. But to remind us, this world is not our home. That God is preparing us in this world for something better. Where we'll be with Jesus forever. This is the proving ground. This is the testing ground. This is where the refinement takes place. So that we can experience the joyful presence of being in God's presence forever. We need to learn from Jesus. We need to abide in Him. We need to get rid of our independent spirit. That wants to sort of say, God, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. God, through all of your experiences at work, on the job, all the frustrations that you're feeling, you're not, He is calling you to say, surrender, depend on me. You don't need to depend on yourself. You don't need to feel bad about being that self-made person. God is seeking to refine and shape us to be like the Son. You notice Jesus spent a lot of time in the wee hours of the night doing what? On his knees praying to the Father. In his most difficult and darkest moments of life. In his struggles with rejection. And those nasty 
sort of challenges by the Pharisees and knowing Judas was walking with his disciples about to betray him, Jesus spent time connecting with the Father. And Jesus was modeling to us to go through the road of suffering and rejection and pain. We have to connect with our Heavenly Father in prayer. We have to. A verse in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says, Though he was a son, he was the Son of God. He learned obedience in his humanity by the things that he suffered. Oh. Jesus came to this earth to embrace suffering that comes with life, the rejection that comes with life in a sinful world. Jesus came to provide hope and healing and strength and resurrection power so that his children could rise above it, stronger and more gracious and more merciful and more sensitive and more concerned about the lost people in this world who have been rejected, who've been despised, who've been, who've been the, the source of many unjust experiences in life so that we can show them the love and grace of God that we've received through Jesus. Being conformed to the image of the sun is not a spiritual cakewalk that some preachers like to make it. Where everything goes our way. Where we always get what we want. Where we always get justice. Where we all people will always treat us right. Where where every right is or every wrong is made right. No, I, I have a savior who walked a path of being despised and rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And even though the causes of our suffering and rejection may be totally of sin, they may be evil intent on the part of the person who is bringing that on our life, God has a purpose to fulfill in our lives through these things. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. Servants, be subjective to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle uh, masters, but also to those who are unjust. Now, this is talking about your boss, who might be unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin, you are beaten, for it and you endure. In other words, you should expect probably to be beaten or experience some kind of consequences if you do something that is sinful. But notice he says, but if you, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is gracious in the sight of God. For it is God who called us to, because of Christ, uh, for this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his death. What kind of an example? Though he's reviled, what did he do? He didn't revile in return. People insult, insulted Jesus to the max. They spit at him. That's the most that's the most degrading insult at all. And what did he do? He stood there and he took it. And I like the two phrases that stick out to me in this passage. This is a gracious thing when mindful of God, mindful of His purpose and presence to help you through this experience. And for this you were called. You see that? For this you were called. Uh, this is a gracious thing when mindful of God. They are key factors to help us be receptive to God's refining work through the means of suffering, pain, and rejection and injustice. Both phrases communicate God has a purpose to accomplish through this for us. And when we're mindful of Him, 
When we're mindful of Jesus, who bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus bore in His body on the tree our rejection, our injustice, our sins, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. When we are mindful of Jesus, And when we remember that this is part of our calling in Christ to make us like Him, we can receive this work of God's refinement rather than resist it. Rather than be disillusioned by it. Rather than run away from God and say, I don't, I don't want anything to do with you if that's what I have to experience. And I think somehow, again, we are spoiled in this world thinking that somehow we get a free pass from things like that in life. And folks, we're going to experience them whether we're a Christian or not. But because you have Jesus Christ, you have help, you have strength, you have power to overcome these things and not become a bitter person in life, but a better person. In James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast <coughs> trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So, a few questions for you to follow. Do you understand God's desire to refine your life to be like Jesus? Do you, do you understand that that's what God wants to do? He wants to refine your life. Number two, understand that are we receptive to God's refining work? Can we embrace it when it comes? Do we seek to learn from it? Do we draw nearer to Him and seek His face? In the face of suffering and spiritual difficulty. Because when we can, and when we do, the image of Christ begins to be seen in us in such a way that people who don't have Jesus Christ see that and they want that. You see, so many expressions of Christianity today are hypocritical and they're they're false and and they're the least of what anybody wants. But it's when we're able to walk through the road of suffering and come out of it limping. And we walk with a limp, confident in our Savior, that He is faithful, that He is just, He is true. People are going to see this. Jesus makes a difference. That there's power in His name. That He's shaping and molding His people because He's alive in them. He's working in them. And they see the sweetness of Jesus coming out of our life when we're able to stand in the face of difficulties and demonstrate grace and mercy and kindness and compassion and forgiveness. And when we see the people who, who brought the injustice on our life, who rejected us, we can be ready with the love of Christ, the power of Christ, the mercy of Christ, the joy of Christ, Because you know, that's going to soften things more than a piece of my mind. That's only going to make things worse. God is working to refine my life. Man, I can sit back being 50, almost 56 years old going, how many times have I sat and fought God's refining work in my life? <clears throat> 
God, you can't do that. No, I'm not going to let that happen. No, I'm going to fight that. Guess what? I have to go through that again. And again. And again. And again until I learn it. Because God is not finished with me yet. Right? God's relentless. He doesn't force us to respond to things. But he uses the circumstances of life to draw us to him who is life eternal and to enjoy him and all the power and the beauty and the glory of who he is so that that can come through our sorrows and sufferings and our losses and experiences of life. It allows us to live with joyful anticipation that something better is coming. No more tears. No more sadness. No more rejection. No more pain. No more sadness. Father, the hardest prayer every one of us is going to have to make today is, God, bring it on. I'm open to your refining work in my life. Now that I understand that, you know, God's refining work begins in your life when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And today that could be your day. To the quietness of your heart, say, Lord Jesus, I want to draw near to you, the Savior who suffered and died for me. I, I want life from you. I know that I've sinned. I receive you. I want you to be my Savior. For Christians who are here, Maybe something's happened in your life. Maybe you're stuck in your Christian life because of something that, a painful experience that happened. Something horrible happened. And, and you're just stuck. And today you want to be free in Jesus. Whoever wants to be free in Jesus, I want you to come. I want to pray for you. Because I want to be free with you. I don't have a song, but I want you to just where every head's by, I want you to get out of your seat and say, I want to be free in Jesus today because, because, because I'm, I'm struggling and I, 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 I want to be free. I want to be, I want to be whole. I want to be new. I, I, I want to be like Jesus. If that's your desire, you've experienced some, some pain, you're stuck, you say, today I want to be unstuck because I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm trusting in Him. I'm walking with Him. I don't know where it's going to take me, but I, I know I'm confident with that. I want you to get out of your seat right now and meet me right up here. Every, eye, every head bow, every eye closed for just a second because I want to pray with you this morning. Don't, don't hesitate. If you want prayer, for that. I want to be free.